Tonight we're going to look at the unsolved mystery iceberg. The iceberg will be linked in the description below. The author states it's a work in progress. Right now it's already 11 layers deep, which is way more than enough to do a video with. The subject matter is all over the place. There's ecological mysteries, unresolved murders, unidentified individuals, missing persons, puzzles, science, mysterious objects, the paranormal, modern events, missing aircraft and ships, odd deaths, media mysteries, other crimes, historical events, unknown words, languages and sounds, locations, extraterrestrial encounters, and finally, lost media and philosophy. In the interest of saving time, I will give a brief summary of each mystery and discuss a theory or two, but I won't be doing a deep dive. So I'm sure I'll miss key aspects and details of some cases, and the ones that I consider boring I will simply gloss over. So without further ado, let's dive on in. Starting with Layer 1. Would you, could you, on a train. On September 27, 2016 at 6.17 p.m., a FEMA message would interrupt a WKTV broadcast in New York. The message would state, quote, Civil authorities have issued a hazardous material warnings for the United States. Effective until September 29th, 2.16 a.m. Would you, could you, on a train, wait for further instructions, end quote. The message itself would not be acknowledged by WKTV for up to almost a full day later. When they would finally tweet, there was no warning. It was just a technical error. But what really makes this a mystery is the following day the Hoboken train crash occurred, killing one person and injuring over a hundred more. It didn't take long for conspiracies to start. WKTV would come out after this and say they never pushed the original message, that it was FEMA. FEMA would respond to this and say they had not pushed a message either, insisting that WKTV had been hacked. Investigations would start, but they would never find the hacker. Crash investigators would find out that the train's engineer accelerated it from 8 miles per hour to 21 miles per hour right before impact, more than twice the speed limit. Conspiracy theorists would insist that whoever had hacked WKTV was able to hack the train somehow, causing it to speed up and out of control and crash. However, crash investigators would point to the train's engineer who had severe sleep apnea as the most likely cause of the crash. Oumuamua's Origins On October 19, 2017, a small red object estimated to be between 300 to 3,000 feet long and 115 to 548 feet wide would go sailing past the sun. And while objects flying through our solar system happen pretty frequently, this was unique in the fact that it seemed to accelerate as it passed us. This fueled theories that it could have been some type of alien craft, maybe a solar cell or a listening device. Scientists have claimed that it contained hydrogen ice and the sun's heat could have caused the hydrogen to sublimate, which in turn could propel the body forward. However, there is no definitive explanation of what Oumuamua was. 2001 Anthrax Attacks Between September 18th, October 12th, 2001, someone would mail anthrax spores to several people in the United States. The targets mainly consisted of senators and media figures. In total, five people would end up dead, 17 others infected. Since the country was still reeling from the World Trade Center terror attack, many people immediately thought Al-Qaeda was responsible for this too. However, they would be ruled out fairly quickly, as this was just too sophisticated for Al-Qaeda. Early suspicion fell on a bioweapons expert named Stephen Hatfield. However, he would later sue and win $5 million from the FBI for being wrongly suspected. By April 2005, the FBI would circle in on a man named Bruce Edwards Ivins. He would become the first real viable suspect. Ivins was a scientist at the biodefense lab in Frederick, Maryland. The FBI would spend two years building a case against Ivins before they finally put him under surveillance. Only three months later would Ivins commit suicide, taking any secrets with him. And by August 2008, federal prosecutors would name Ivins as the culprit based on DNA evidence coming from an anthrax ball in his lab. By 2010, the FBI would also formally close its investigation, and this is when the real mystery starts. A year after the FBI closed its investigation, the National Academy of Sciences would release a report that cast a doubt on the FBI's conclusion. The FBI would counter this claim by stating their investigation was not based on science alone and that they couldn't divulge some of the evidence, such as Ivan's mental health. There are other reasons for doubts. For one, Ivan's was only one of 100 people that had access to these vials. 
Also, the FBI could never place him near the New Jersey mailbox that the anthrax was mailed from. They were also unable to find any spores in Ivan's house, vehicle, or any of his belongings. And to add further doubt, the bacteriology division at the Army Laboratory said it lacked the facilities to make the spores that were sent out in those letters in 2001, and the federal government confirmed this. However, the FBI and Justice Department still believe it was Ivan's. Theories are torn to this day. Some state it was Syria or Iraq that directed the attacks, or that the U.S. government knew that it was coming and allowed it to happen, or it just straight up FBI incompetence. Others still think it was Ivan's, or that it was Ivan's working with others. 2016 Clown Sightings In early August 2016, five pictures of a creepy clown roaming around a vacant parking lot under a bridge at nighttime in downtown Green Bay started going viral. This would be quickly confirmed, however, as a marketing stunt. But after this, clown sightings would start popping up more frequently in the UK, Canada, and Australia. Nobody knew exactly what they were up to, which caused a little bit of a panic. Panic would reach unprecedented heights when the Russian embassy would even issue warnings to their citizens living in London to take caution because of the clowns. Then shops began to pull their clown mask. Universities started forming mobs to search the campus for clowns. And then just like that, the clown hysteria died down without a real explanation. 3000 block of 3rd Avenue kidnapping. On November 12th, 2019 at 11:20 p.m., witnesses on the 3000 block of 3rd Avenue, Los Angeles, California, would report hearing a female scream, "Help me, somebody help me." They would observe seeing the woman being pulled by her dark braided hair into a white Toyota Matrix before it quickly sped off. Shockingly, the whole thing would be caught on a doorbell camera. A male living at the residence where the video was recorded tried to pursue the vehicle, but he could not catch up to it. Police would release the video to the public on November 14th asking for information. Although numerous tips poured in, no one was ever apprehended. Theories range from kidnapping, domestic dispute, to human trafficking. Some chatter optimistically speculated that the woman was mentally ill and that a loved one was trying to keep her from doing harm to herself. 973-NAMUH-973.com the 973 website is a website with strange pictures, numbers, particularly a weird obsession with the number 9, and codes. It seems very focused on Christianity, conspiracy theories, and numerology. The name itself being a backward spelling of the human. The log file for the site states that it's around a thousand pages. The site's creator is a guy named Dave Dennison, who is an artist and mathematician. People have speculated he may possibly suffer from a mental illness, or is in a cult. Regardless, on 973's forum, a user in 2018 posted that he had finally solved the puzzle after five years of studying the site. He claimed that the whole thing was a maze with a series of dead ends and only one path to navigate through it. He would also claim that the website ending would bring you back to the beginning. But he refused to release the key to the puzzle and insisted that it could be found on page two. Whether this was a troll or someone being genuine or even someone affiliated with the site is unknown. A858. Around 2011, Reddit users would discover a strange subreddit known as r slash A858DE45F56D9BC9. The sub contained only strings of letters and numbers and had been posted for close to a year. The users decided the seemingly random characters looked like a code, and the community would start the process of trying to decipher the post. There was little to no help from the creator of the sub, also named A858, and while the occasional message would get decoded, a couple of dozen out of several hundred, progress was slow. The sub itself would get moved to private, which stopped all public discussion about it. Users would create a sub called Solving A858, and in 2015, the original A858 would go to that sub and do a Ask Me Anything, and he would provide the following details. A858 was the team lead for a project called A858. The project was undertaken by part of a larger organization. They are not affiliated with Apple, Microsoft, or Google. They are paid well and consider themselves the good guys. Theories would begin to emerge after this AMA, such as it being a modern day version of number stations, or possibly that the author originally had a purpose for the sub and got bored and left it to be a mystery, or an ARG. The puzzle would never be solved, and the original sub would eventually go private and post a message saying A858 has concluded, please unsubscribe. 
It would return a few years later, only to go private again. Afterlife. So this one I'm just going to gloss over because it's kind of boring. Plus it's tied up into so many different faiths I don't want to offend anybody. And finally, there's just no real evidence one way or the other what happens after we die. Albert Johnson. In 1932, a man of Scandinavian origin would show up to Canada's remote wilderness. He would build a house deep in the woods. After settling in, he would start tampering with the local Inuit's traps, the traps they used to capture game with. They would eventually go to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They go to talk to the man the first time, and he pretty much ignores them, so they leave. They come back later on with a warrant, but as soon as they try to enter, he shoots one without warning. The RCMP would flee and go back to regroup and bring more men. They would come back a second time, and the man would start shooting at them. They would eventually throw dynamite onto this roof, blowing it up. They thought this killed the man, but again, he started shooting from under all the rubble, as he had built a little tunnel under the house. The standoff would last for several hours. Eventually, the RCMP would flee again, as temperatures were reaching negative 45 Fahrenheit, and they were unprepared to stay the night. They would return with more men, and they would track him a few days, until they finally found him in a thicket. A gunfight would break out. He would end up killing another officer and escaping, this time climbing straight down a steep mountainside with no equipment. Eventually, the RCMP would call on a World War I legend, a Canadian ace pilot named Watt May to fly over. This would end up being the first fugitive ever tracked by air. Eventually, the RCMP would close in again, and again, they would have another officer shot, but this time they would hit and kill Johnson. Now the mystery. This man's name wasn't even Albert Johnson. In fact, we still don't know what his name was. Nobody knew who this guy was, or why he was fleeing and resisting to the point of death. After pictures were sent all over Canada and the U.S., tips poured in and most were eliminated. The few that remained questionable were later disqualified by DNA tests. As late as January 2022, rumors picked up that the RCMP finally knows who Albert Johnson really was. They are continuing with familial DNA testing before confirming. Amelia Earhart. Here's another one everybody has heard about, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Amelia Earhart was attempting a flight all the way around the world. She would have been the first woman to accomplish this, but on the last leg of the journey, flying from Leigh to Howland Island, Amelia would call in to report they were 200 miles off of the island, and after that call, a flurry of miscommunications would start to happen. All contact would eventually be lost, and after a 150,000 square mile search, the most expensive up till that time, no evidence that Earhart was found, and the search would be caught off. The most widely held and plausible theory is that Earhart and Noonan simply ran out of fuel and crashed into the ocean. The second most plausible theory states they made it to Gardner Island and died there shortly after. Numerous searches of the island have yielded interesting clues, but nothing concrete. Amy Lynn Bradley Amy was an American woman who went missing on a Caribbean cruise ship in March 1998 at the age of 23. At around 3.40 a.m. on March 23rd, records showed that Amy would return to her cabin after a night of dancing. Amy's father would wake up between 5.15 and 5.30, and he would see Amy on the balcony. However, when he awoke again just 30 minutes later at 5 a.m., he did not see Amy. He would search all the common areas of the ship and would not find her. He would return to his room and alert his wife and son. Authorities would be alerted, and the Netherlands Antilles Coast Guard would do a four-day search in the surrounding waters, but they could not find any sign of Amy. They would speculate she fell overboard and drowned. However, Amy was an excellent swimmer and former lifeguard, and there was no proof that she had fell overboard. They would eventually contact the FBI, who would fly in the next day. The FBI could not find her either. However, they did suspect foul play. In the years that would pass, numerous sightings of Amy would be reported. However, none of these have been confirmed or led to any real proof of anything, but there has been speculation she was trafficked. A key piece of evidence came in 2005 when a photo was emailed to Amy's family purportedly showing Amy in an escort ad. The woman in question does bear a strong resemblance to Amy. However, one has to wonder why an ad would be posted online for a now famous missing woman that the FBI was currently looking for. A couple forensic analysts have said that the pictures are 100% Amy. Finally were all the inconsistencies of witnesses the night of the disappearance. In particular, the staff and band members were questioned. One band member, a bassist nicknamed Yellow, would become the center of attention for a while. 
In addition, photos of the Bradleys were taken and sold on board. Amy's dad discovered that every picture featuring Amy was gone, so the possibility that Amy in some way met foul play with a staff member of the cruise line and thrown overboard has been speculated about. But there's also many investigators who state that Amy most likely fell overboard. This is the most simple explanation. Angel Hair On November 2, 1959, Professor Amaral, a biologist at a local college in southern Portugal, would go to lunch. As he made his way out, he would run into one of his students who would tell him about a strange airplane in the sky. The professor would see a small, gray-blue glowing object flying far up above in a pattern. He would quickly go back in and get his telescope. He would see a seamless, elliptic object, perhaps the size of a commercial jet, except it had no wings or windows or propellers. It would hover at times. Minutes later, a second object would appear, similar to the first, except larger. In fact, the official report would say colossal. This would last 30 minutes until the vessel sped up and disappeared without a sound. The professor would be even further stunned when a white filament would start to fall from the sky. The substance looked like spider webs, so many that it formed clumps, but not a single spider was found. The professor would quickly run in and grab a petri dish and go back out to catch the falling web and take it back in to investigate. The web would soon be dubbed as angel hair, as it resembled very fine white hair. The falling of the angel hair would last around four hours. So much fell that it turned the red roofs white. The professor would put the web under a microscope. He discovered it wasn't webs at all, and after magnifying about 120 times, he could see a tiny organism, about one millimeter wide, with a unicellular central core. The slime was yellowish, but the limbs darker. Not long after this, a friend would call Professor Amaral. It was Professor Silva. He had called to tell him about an experience his son had with some web falling from the sky. Amaral could not believe someone else miles away had seen the same phenomena. Silva would take a cab back to Amaral's to study the web together. They would take turns viewing through a microscope. They would find a central body that was yellow. Tentacles that emerged from the body were bright red. When under stress, it would display defensive reactions. After Amaral talked to numerous experts, he had yet to find a plausible theory. One believed it could be deep sea debris that was found to the continent on a weather balloon. Another implied that it could be the residue of an inorganic gas. Amaral would follow his report and hand over his microscopic samples to the University of Lisbon. Amaral would die in the 90s with no answer. New research would begin in the 2000s, yet no one has still been able to determine what the UFO or angel hair was. Axeman of New Orleans The Axeman of New Orleans was a serial killer active in New Orleans from May 1918 to October 1919. He mainly targeted Italian immigrants and Italian Americans, to be more specific, usually ones that were connected to grocery stores. The murders followed a common theme. Usually the killer would remove a panel to the back door of a home with a chisel, then attack the residents with what he could find on hand, typically an axe, but a couple of times he would use a straight razor. The attacks were particularly vicious. Considering how he never took anything from the home, robbery was not the motive. Crime analysts have basically suggested two theories. One was that he was a sadist and the killings were sexually motivated only killing male victims when they obstructed his attempt to assault a woman. The second more plausible theory was it was mafia-related killings. New Orleans was home to the first official mafia family in the U.S., and at the time, the mob was using grocery stores as fronts for rackets and extortions. This would explain why every case, except one, involved someone connected to an Italian grocery store. Some crime buffs have actually connected the Axeman to murders as early as 1910 and as late as 1922. But this is disputed, and the only official Axeman murders are from 1918 and 1919. He's most famous for allegedly writing a newspaper and telling the people of New Orleans that if they played jazz music in their home on a certain night, he would spare them. However, the letter was never confirmed as being from the real Axeman. While it's almost a given that the vast majority of people in New Orleans didn't play music in their home that night, there were definitely a significant amount of people scared enough to do it as well as the numerous dance halls that spread out over the city. The crime spree would stop as quickly as it started, and although there's been conjecture over a person named Joseph Mumphrey, no real suspects have ever been identified. Ball Lightning Ball lightning is an unexplained phenomenon described as a spherical object that varies from pea size to several meters in diameter. The observed phenomenon is reported to last longer than a typical split-second flash of a lightning bolt. 
There have been several recorded accounts throughout history, going back to the ancient Greeks. Descriptions of ball lightning vary widely, but they share typical properties such as frequently appearing with cloud-to-ground lightning, spherical or pear-shaped with fuzzy edges, brightness of a lamp, wide rings of color, yellow being the most common, lasting one second to over a minute, moves few meters per second, rotational motion, disappears rapidly either silent or explosive. There are several theories to what ball lightning is, too many to go over in this video. The Baltic Sea Anomaly is a sonar image of an object on the ocean floor that looks artificially made. The image was taken by Ocean X diving team while treasure hunting on the North Baltic Sea. The team would revisit the following year to get a clearer image, but claimed a mysterious electronic interference prevented them. Many have speculated it could be a sunken UFO, or something that fell from outer space, or a sunken city. Tests from around the area were eventually taken and scientists suggested that it was a glacial deposit. The Battle of Los Angeles on February 24, 1942, the Office of Naval Intelligence would issue a warning that a mainland attack on California could be expected within the next 10 hours. That evening, flares and blinking lights were reported in the vicinity of defense plants. An alert was called at 8.18 p.m. and lifted at 10.23 p.m. Air raid sirens would begin at 2.25 a.m. A total blackout was issued for L.A. and air raid wardens were sent to their positions at 3.16 a.m. The 50 caliber machine guns and anti-aircraft shells would blast into the air at the reported aircraft. Over 1,400 shells were fired. The artillery fire would continue sporadically until 4.14 a.m. and then the all-clear was sounded. The blackout would be lifted at 7.21 a.m. Several buildings and vehicles were damaged. Five civilians died as an indirect result of the anti-aircraft. Three in car accidents due to the chaos and two of heart attacks. So what were they shooting at? Within hours of the air raid, the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, would hold a press conference and say that it was a false alarm due to war nerves. But the Secretary of War, Henry Stinson, would state that at least 15 planes had buzzed the city, and that it could have been commercial aircraft operated by enemy agents hoping to strike fear into the public. Some press outlets started to suspect a cover-up. They would speculate that Japan had a secret base in northern Mexico, or that Japanese subs stationed offshore could carry planes. When the war ended in 1945, the Japanese government would declare that they had not flown any airplanes over LA at the time during the war. In 1949, the United States Coast Artillery Association would claim that it was a weather balloon released at 1 a.m. that caused all the panic. However, the obvious flaw here is how do you shoot 1,400 shells at an air balloon and not deflate it? Beast of Bowdoin Moor In 1978, Bowdoin Moor of Southwest Britain became the center of alleged Black Panther Puma-like sightings. In addition, Numerous reports of mutilated livestock would occur. In 1995, years after reports, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Food would conduct an official investigation. And on July 19, 1995, they would report there was no verifiable evidence of an exotic feline loose in Britain, and that farm animals were most likely attacked by common indigenous species. However, by 1997, another investigation would be launched, this time in response to bite marks on farm animals droppings, and photographs, one which was taken through binoculars close to Cornwall of what looked to be an adult pregnant female jaguar. The cat looked to be around three and a half feet long. But how could this be possible? Well, in the 1970s, a law called the Dangerous and Wild Animals Act was passed. This law created strict welfare rules and made it nearly impossible for people to keep exotic animals as pets. But since people already owned them, they chose to let them go into the wild rather than pay bills associated with the new laws. We know for a fact that at least two people released multiple pumas into the wild. And from 1978 to 2011, there have been close to 300 reported sightings. This could be where the beast comes from. However, most big cats tend to have a lifespan of around 8 to 13 years. Which means if there were any cats released in the 80s, they would have been long gone before 2011 unless the cats were able to repopulate. But this brings up other issues like food. Southwest Britain doesn't have the amount of prey available to support a big cat population. Beebe's Abyssal Fishes William Beebe was a famous marine biologist. He is most remembered for the numerous expeditions he conducted for the New York Zoological Society, his deep dives in the bathosphere, and his prolific scientific writing for the academic and popular audiences. On November 22, 1932, he would lower 2,100 feet beneath the surface of the sea. And it's here he would discover five fish never seen before. He would name the fish the following. The Abyssal Rainbow Gar, 
Basperia Antarctica, Five Line Constellation Fish, Pilot Sailfin, and a Three Star Angler Fish. He gave a detailed description of each fish. However, close to 100 years later, and no one has spotted these fish ever since. So, what exactly did BB see? Beginning of plate tectonics. This is another one I find kind of boring, so we'll just gloss over it. But the mystery is, when did plate tectonics begin, and what happened before it? Most current research says about 3.2 billion years ago, but no one's really for sure. Beyond the observable universe. The observable universe is a ball-shaped region of the universe comprising of all matter that can be observed from Earth or our space-based telescopes. There may be several hundred billion galaxies in our universe alone. There's no real way to describe just how big the universe is, so it's even more difficult to make a guess at what lies outside the observable universe. However, this has not stopped scientists from trying. One theory states that beyond our observable universe is more or less the same as what we can see in our observable universe. Another wild theory is the multiverse, a universe where multiple universes coexist and where our universe lies. But just like plate tectonics, this is just too deep to discuss in this video, so I'll move on. Black Dahlia On the morning of January 15, 1947, a woman's nude body, severed into two pieces, was found on a vacant lot by a local resident. She ran to a nearby house to telephone the police. The woman's body, who police would later identify as Elizabeth Short, was severely mutilated. The body had been washed and her face slashed from mouth to ears. She had several cuts all over her body and the flesh had been sliced away. The only clues left was a heel print on the ground among tire tracks and a cement sack containing watery blood nearby. Police would catch their first break on January 21st when a person claiming to be Short's killer placed a phone call to the office of James Richardson, the editor of the Examiner, congratulating Richardson on the paper's coverage of the case. Instead, he would turn himself in after allowing the police to chase him a bit more. He additionally told Richardson to expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. Three days later, a suspicious manila envelope was discovered by a postal worker. The envelope was addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers, with individual words that had been cut and pasted from newspaper clippings. Additionally, a large message that read, Here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. The envelope contained Schwartz's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, names written on pieces of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. The pack had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, just like the body. But despite the cleaning, partial fingerprints were lifted from the envelope and sent to the FBI. Frustratingly, the prints were compromised in transit and the FBI could not analyze them. Later that same day, a black suede shoe and handbag were discovered in a garbage can in an alley just two miles from Schwartz's body. Those two were wiped with gasoline. Mark Hansen, the name on the address book, would be interrogated along with about 150 other suspects and all of them would be cleared. The state would put up to 750 investigators on the case, but they could come up with nothing. A city councilman would even post a $10,000 reward, which is the equivalent of $121,000 today, for information and nothing of substance would come from it. Years would pass and no one would ever get arrested for the crime. However, the LA District Attorney's Office said there are 24 viable suspects that were ever truly considered by the LAPD. Way too many to go through here without going down some deep rabbit holes. The case remains unsolved. Black-Eyed Children Black-Eyed Children is a supposed paranormal creature that resembles children between the ages 6 to 16 with pale skin and black eyes. Usually the children show up at people's houses and speak with a monotone voice, asking to make a phone call, use the bathroom, a bite to eat, or a ride home, etc. The adult then reports feeling a sense of overwhelming dread before realizing there's something very wrong with the children's eyes. First reported in 1996 by Texas reporter Brian Bethel after a strange encounter he had with two of the Black Eyed Children. The Black Eyed Children wouldn't get well known until February 2013 when MSN would do a feature on the phenomenon. There are numerous stories, yet no tangible proof, no pictures, nothing. Most people chalk it up to creepypasta. Boltzmann Brain Now on to another boring mystery, at least to me. The Boltzmann Brain theory basically states, it's more likely that a brain could spontaneously and briefly form in a complete void than for the universe to have came about in a way cosmologists actually think. This was a theory that was named after physicist Ludwig Boltzmann. 
who published a theory that tried to account for the fact that humans find themselves in a universe that is not as chaotic as previously thought. Of course, there's no way to prove this, so... Boy in the Box February 1957 A boy's body wrapped in a plaid blanket was found in the woods of Fox Chase, Philadelphia. The boy looked to be around six or seven. The naked body was found inside a cardboard box which once contained a bassinet sewed by J.C. Penney's. The boy's hair had just been cut, possibly after death, and clumps clung to the body. There were signs of severe malnourishment as well as surgical scars on the ankle, groin, and chin. The first person to find the body was a young man checking muskrat traps. He would not report it though to fear of the police confiscating his traps. A few days later, a college student would find and report the body. At the actual site of the body, very little was found, other than a man's blue corduroy cap, a child's scarf, a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner, but none of these clues would lead to anything. In February 2002, a woman known only as Martha, or M, would go to the police and claim she knew who the boy was. His name was Jonathan, and he had been purchased by her abusive mother in 1954. The boy would be abused for two and a half years before the woman would go too far one day and the boy would never wake up. But what makes this believable is that the woman reported that the abuse occurred after the boy had vomited up a meal of baked beans. The coroner all those years back recorded that the stomach contained baked beans and told the police. The police had kept it a secret for close to 60 years. The woman had also reported that he was given a bath during which he died. Again, a detail the police had kept close was the fact that the boy's fingers were water wrinkled, indicative of a bath. And finally, during the 1957 investigation, a witness came forward and reported that he had seen a female motorist who was trying to remove a box from the back of a car. The motorist offered to help, but the woman said she was okay and could get it herself. The man eventually drove off. This was kept confidential. But now, close to 50 years later, this Martha was repeating the same story. The police were troubled by Martha, though, as she had a long history of severe mental illness and had no way to verify her story. To add even more doubt, a man came forward that knew Martha from when they were children. He lived down the street from her and had visited their house many times, and he had visited there during the supposed time frame that this boy was staying there, and he said he never saw anyone, and the whole story was ridiculous. The case is still being worked on, and in early 2021, the body was exhumed, and DNA was sent to a European lab. By late 2021, investigators would state they hoped to release the boy's name by the end of the year, and that this was the closest they have been to a resolution. Hopefully 2022 will bring that answer. Bradford Bishop On March 10, 1976, a man would report to the police that his neighbor Bradford Bishop and his family had not been seen in some time. A detective sent to the home would find blood on the front porch of the Bishop residence as well as on the floor and walls of the front hall and bedrooms. This would start an intense search for the Bishop family. Making things worse was the fact that Bradford served in the Foreign Service of the U.S. State Department. An investigation would be launched. They would find that Bradford had left his office in D.C. March 1st after complaining to his secretary that he did not feel well. He would go to get several hundred dollars from his bank, go to a mall, and then buy a sledgehammer and gas can. He filled the gas can and tank of his 1974 station wagon. He would leave there to go buy a shovel and pitchfork. Bishop would return home between 7.30 and 8 p.m. It's believed that he killed his wife first, followed by his mother, finally his three sons. Bishop would then drive the bodies 275 miles to a densely wooded swamp south of Columbia, North Carolina. The following day, he would dig a shallow hole where he would pile the bodies and set them ablaze. On March 18th, investigators would locate the station wagon in Elkmont, Tennessee, about 400 miles from the site where he buried his family, and just a couple of miles from the Appalachian Trail. Upon searching the car, they found dog biscuits, a bloody blanket, shotgun, axe, shaving kit, and Bishop's medicine. A witness placed the car there between March 5th and 7th. Police believed he joined the constant flow of hikers on the Appalachian Trail as means to escape. Police would use bloodhounds but could not pick up a scent. As for motives, no one could really find any. He did have a history of depression, though, and he had also been turned down for a promotion the day that he left the office fueling speculation that that might have pushed him over the edge. Some people have also said that he might have viewed his wife as being a reason for his tension, as he had wanted to take a job with the Foreign Service overseas. However, his wife was pursuing her own career and did not want to move or to be a housewife like Bradford wanted her to be. 
Bishop also had a diplomatic passport which he could have traveled on, and with a one-week head start on authorities, he could have easily gotten out of the country. Numerous sightings have placed him in Italy, Belgium, England, Finland, the Netherlands, Germany, Greece, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. However, by 2014, authorities would state they believe he is now residing in the U.S., possibly in California, and he's managed to stay off the radar by keeping a low profile. And despite being in his mid-80s, law enforcement still believes he is alive. Brandon Lee Death Footage While filming The Crow in 1993, actor Brandon Lee in his first lead performance would tragically die. During production, Brandon was on the set filming an action scene. In the middle of a stunt, a gun that was loaded with a blank cartridge suffered a malfunction. The spent blank casing from an earlier shot jammed into the barrel. Upon using the gun again, the second blank went off and propelled the cartridge from the earlier shot forward, which hit Lee. He was rushed to the hospital but died later that day. His death was caught on camera and was allegedly destroyed under the insistence of the director. However, and this is where the mystery comes in, some of the cameramen claim otherwise, including one who claims to own a copy. The footage has never been released or seen, and no legitimate stills have ever been found. There's also a story that the police came in and took the video's crime scene evidence and never released it. Although it's not a huge mystery to me, it is a big deal in the lost media community. Brian Schaefer On March 31st, a medical student at Ohio State University named Brian Schaefer would go out with his friends to celebrate spring break. At 9 p.m., Schaefer would meet his friend William Florence at the Ugly Tuna Saloon. They would depart there and go bar hopping while taking a shot of hard liquor at each establishment. They would meet Florence's friend, Meredith Reed, who would give them a ride back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna, where they had started. They would all do one last round. While the three were there, Schaefer separated from them. They would eventually start calling him as they could not find him. When the bar closed, they stood outside waiting for him, but he never showed. He would eventually be reported missing after his father and girlfriend could not get a hold of him that weekend. Police would begin their search at the Ugly Tuna Saluna. Security cam footage would be reviewed. Schaefer would be seen at 1.55 a.m., briefly talking to two women before saying goodbye, then moving off into the direction of the bar to re-enter. The camera would not record him leaving shortly afterwards when the Ugly Tuna Saluna closed, and this would be the last time he was seen. There was one other exit in the building, but it was a service door not typically used by the public, and it only opened to a construction site that someone would have difficulty walking through, especially someone that was intoxicated. Investigators would check the cameras of neighboring bars to see how Schaefer left the Ugly Tuna Saluna, but all the footage from nearby showed no trace of him leaving. Police would decide to push their investigation away from the bar. They would search all around the area, including trash bins, even the sewer, but no leads. The most favored theory is that Schaefer went out the back through the construction zone. This would account for him not being spotted on camera. And the lead investigator at the time also believed that Schaefer most likely made it through the construction site. But whatever happened from there was anybody's guess. Other theories include Schaefer leaving to start a new life. It was widely believed that he was only going to be a doctor because that's what his parents wanted. Finally, foul play. When William Florence was asked to do a polygraph, he declined and got a lawyer. That does not make one guilty, and it's generally advised as a smart thing to do, but it does make you wonder. Brown Mountain Lights the Brown Mountain Lights are a series of ghost lights reported sporadically for many years near Brown Mountain, North Carolina. The lights have been seen at several locations about 60 to 70 miles northeast of Asheville. The earliest sightings were officially reported in 1910. The lights are most often reported as a small star-like dots of light with a brightness comparable to stars. Motions of the light vary, from slow movements to firework type movements. In 1913, the United States Geological Survey would send out an employee to see what the lights were. He quickly surmised that it was just headlights of a westbound Southern Railways locomotive. However, three years later in 1916, a flood would cause train activity to stop for several weeks, yet the lights remained active. Six years later in 1922, the U.S. government again would send out a Geological Survey employee to investigate. He would again find that it was train headlights plus car headlights and brush fires. This could have been a decent guess, as the sightings coincided with the rapidly expanded electrification of Linville, North Carolina, 1890-1910. There's also the fact that Southern Railways began upgrading their locomotive headlamps to 600,000 candle power systems in 1909, rendering their trains light output greater than some lighthouses, 
which could further be mistaken for ghost lights. But in 2016, after five years of constant recording, scientists from Appalachian State would finally capture Brown Mountain lights on camera. They have ruled out every source of artificial light and theorized that it could be ball lightning or gases rising from the mountain. Capitol Hill's Mystery Soda Machine Now for a more wholesome mystery. From the early 90s until 2018, a mystery soda machine operated on Capitol Hill, Seattle. The machine operated with regular sodas and a couple of mystery options. The dispensed drinks were rare cans usually unavailable in the U.S. or had not been in circulation since the 80s. Drinks included Mountain Dew Whiteout, a raspberry flavored Nestle Brisk, a Hawaiian Punch, a Grape Fanta, Lemon Lime Slice, Pepsi AM, Diet Hubba Bubba Bubble Gum, and even Bacon Infused Soda. By 2014, the regular soda selections were all replaced, leaving only mystery selections. After the 30 years in operation, no one knew who owned the machine. The closest business was a locksmith, and they claimed they never seen anyone stock it. Many people assumed that the locksmith business actually operated the machine, but the locksmith and their employees have all denied it and have stuck with their story for over 30 years. The machine would start to generate national interest in the 2010s when Vice and other websites would try to find the owner. After asking the city of Seattle who owned the permit for it, Seattle would claim they couldn't find one, which meant whoever was operating the machine was doing it illegally. By June 2018, the machine disappeared and a message was posted to the machine's Facebook page stating, going for a walk, need to find myself, maybe take a shower even. By 2021, YouTuber Amara in Seattle would post a very interesting video. Driving through a residential area, she would see a newer version of the mystery soda machine. Two of the buttons would still contain the yellow mystery tags. Well, there was also a new Facebook tag, and now one with a question mark that just said sugar free. The machine sat way off the curb, and actually in someone's yard against a wooden fence. What makes this video particularly interesting is the white van sitting in the driveway next to the soda machine. That is relevant because one of the only photos ever taken of the soda machine being restocked showed a couple that were driving a white van. Amara in Seattle would also claim that going to the Facebook link confirmed that it was the same people that ran the old one, and that the old machine had been destroyed. The machine can now be spotted on Google Maps. Carnival of Light Carnival of Light is another lost media mystery. On January 5th, 1967, shortly after overdubbing sessions took place on their song Penny Lane, the Beatles would record an experimental track for an upcoming art, light, and sound festival. The track would be entitled Carnival of Light and is said to be 13 minutes and 48 seconds long. And besides the two original events on which the track was played, it has never been heard by the general public. McCartney tried to have the track released in 1996, intending to use it on their compilation record, The Beatles Anthology 2. But it was voted against by George Harrison stating that he didn't like avant-garde music. The song is a huge mystery for Beatles fans and lost media fans alike. McCartney claims to still have the track and hopes to release it at some point. China Brain China Brain is another thought experiment dealing with consciousness. The experiment simply states that if you took the whole population of China and gave everyone a walkie-talkie or phone and had them communicating with one another to control an outer body, would that body take a conscious? This debate is supposed to simulate the neurons of a brain. Each one by themselves can't do anything, but working together as a collective allows them to do a lot of things. Which leads to further debated questions. Is an ant colony conscious? Is a beehive conscious? Is a city conscious? So the mystery really comes down to what you believe consciousness is. Kavefe. Six minutes after midnight on May 31st, 2017, then President Trump tweeted, quote, Despite the constant negative press, Kavefe, he deleted the tweet six hours later and implied that its wording was intentional. Most media outlets presumed he had meant to type coverage but White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer stated, I think the president and a small group of people knew exactly what he meant. Trump would tweet at 6.09 a.m. Who can figure out the true meaning of Kefefe? Enjoy. Many of Trump's opposition would insist that it was Trump refusing to admit when he made the tiniest of mistakes. Trump supporters, however, would claim there was a hidden meaning behind it. However, that meaning would never surface. Cut off my feet. In 2001, a 33-year-old man named Paul Morgan launched an ambitious plan. In a time when there was no social media and the internet was still primarily dial-up, 
Morgan wanted to do a live feed, and not just any live feed. Morgan planned to cut his feed off while watched by subscribers. The real story starts in 1986. Morgan would claim to have suffered a major spinal injury when he fell out of a car and was run over by a boat that it was towing. It was an incredible amount of luck that he survived, but he had to have a series of operations. He could just about walk, but he had no feeling in his ankles. By 2001, technology had advanced to where Paul could have his feet replaced by prosthetics and improve his quality of life. But Paul lived in America and his insurance deemed that the operation was not necessary. So Paul came up with an idea. He decided to make a homemade guillotine and cut off his own feet live on the internet, all the while charging 20 bucks per streamer, which would cover his medical costs while also making a statement about the American healthcare system, doing a GoFundMe decades before it existed. Paul's site would go unnoticed until he called the Howard Stern Show to plug it. Then it exploded. The media would pick up the story and the site gained a lot of traffic, but back in 2001, it was a lot harder to transfer money. Even PayPal wasn't that popular, and Paul needed 150000 for the surgery, prosthetics, etc. But Paul had other ideas. He wanted a full production crew, plus he had a band booked. The Stern interview would also alert authorities who were not pleased. They would actually tell Paul DIY surgery is illegal, especially for paying viewers. And the authorities were particularly suspicious that the whole thing was fraud anyway. Paul would keep pushing the date back over and over. He would eventually claim that he was going to build his guillotine in a secret location to hide from the police. However, on Paul's site early 2002, he would claim that corporate lawyers caused him to lose members of the crew, satellite truck, and interested investors, and that he would have to postpone until the production money was secured. He claimed he could not use the money people paid to watch as it was an escrow until he performed the amputation. After that, Paul would essentially disappear from the internet, and to this day, no one knows if it was a hoax or just a man desperate for the medical help that was beyond his finances. Of course today, he could come back and start a fundraiser and probably get the help he needed. So that says Paul either hoaxed or eventually got his surgery or passed on. D.B. Cooper On Thanksgiving Eve 1971, a middle-aged man carrying a black attache case would board a Boeing 727-100. He would identify himself as Dan Cooper. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper would hand a note to the flight attendant nearest him. Assuming that it was his phone number, she ignored the note. He would then tell her to take a look at the note. He had a bomb. After showing the flight attendant the bomb, he would demand $200,000, or roughly the equivalent of $1.3 million in today's money four parachutes, and a fuel truck standing by to refuel in Seattle. And after the plane landed in Seattle, his demands were met. He allowed the passenger to go safely, but kept the crew. The plane would take back off towards Mexico City. He wanted it flown at a minimum speed without stalling the aircraft. He wanted the plane to go no higher than 10,000 feet. He further requested the landing gear remain deployed and the wing flaps lowered 15 degrees and the cabin remain unpressurized. Around 8 p.m., nearly 20 minutes into the flight, a warning light flashed into the cockpit indicating that the air stairs had been activated. The crew would soon notice a change of air pressure indicating that the door was open. At 8.13 p.m., the tail section would sustain a sudden upward movement. The plane would land between 10 and 11.30 with the air stairs still deployed. The captain would check to see and Cooper was no longer aboard. The legend of Dan Cooper, or later on to be named D.B. Cooper, would be born. The authorities launched a massive search, but they could not find anything. However, in 1980, a boy and his family were vacationing on the Columbia River, about 10 miles from Vancouver, Washington. The boy would uncover three packets of ransom cash totaling $5,800 as he raked sand to build a campfire. The bills had disintegrated but were still bundled in rubber bands. The FBI would confirm it was part of the money given to D.B. Cooper. New analysis would be done in 2020 that indicated the money had not entered the water or in the sand for at least several months after the hijacking. Nearly 50 years later, authorities would be no closer to naming a suspect as they would officially suspend the case. So what happened to D.B. Cooper and who was he really? Well, the FBI believes that Cooper almost certainly did not survive the jump. It was pitch black night with rain and 172 mile per hour wind wearing loafers and a trench coat. Even if he survived the jump, the mountainous terrain in Washington is some of the most difficult in the U.S. There's also the fact that the money never entered back into circulation, or at least it was never discovered. Danton Plague of 1518 In July 1518, in what is modern-day eastern France, a woman would begin to dance fervently in the street in Strasbourg. 
This would lead to one of the more bizarre plagues in history, as more and more people started to dance, mostly young women. It would last a long time, so much so that it would attract the attention of the magistrate and bishop. By the time it was all said and done, between 500 and 400 people would take to dancing for days at a time. Many people would collapse from exhaustion. Some people believe the dancing could have been brought on by food poisoning by ergo fungi, which commonly grows on grain used for baking bread. However, this wouldn't explain why they danced for so long, as delusions from fungus would not last that long. Others think it was a stress-induced mass hysteria that caused it. One researcher noted that living in eastern France at the time could have elevated psychological stress caused by years of starvation and disease, which was only made worse by the inhabitants being superstitious. Seven other cases of dancing plagues were reported in the same region during that era, so it would make sense that it was brought on by psychological stress, but we can't be sure. Dark Energy Dark energy is the name given to a mysterious force that's causing the rate of the expansion of our universe to accelerate over time, rather than slow down. The name dark energy would be referred to better as unknown energy. It's one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of cosmology. It is thought that it makes up 68% of everything in the universe, yet we don't know what it is. One leading theory is dark energy is essentially a placeholder for empty space, yet it is not truly empty. It's still a property of the universe and has energy. A second theory is while the universe is always expanding, dark energy forms to fill the void of emptiness and vanishes and reforms as needed. Dark matter. Not to be confused with dark energy, dark matter is believed to make up 85% of matter in the universe. It's called dark because it doesn't appear to interact with the electromagnetic field. It does not absorb, reflect, or emit any electromagnetic radiation like light making it hard to detect. It can only be detected by its gravitational effects but it's best thought of as a glue that holds our solar system and galaxy together. Researchers still don't know what it is, and have never been able to see it to prove that it exists, although the majority of the scientific community agrees that it does exist. There are numerous theories of what it could be, however it's a little too deep for this video. Delphi Murders On February 13th, 2017, 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German were dropped off by German's older sister, on County Road 300 northeast of Hoosier Heartland Highway, the girls were hiking on Moon and High Bridge over Deer Creek. Libby would post a photo of Abby walking over the bridge. After this, they would not be heard from again. They were reported missing at 5.30 p.m. after they failed to meet Liberty's father at 3.15. Authorities quickly searched the area and did not suspect foul play. However, this would change when the bodies were found around noon the next day, about half a mile east of the abandoned Moon and High Bridge. The case has attracted international attention mainly because of a snap German was able to take of the man, although grainy, and him telling the girls to quote, down the hill. Police would also state there was additional evidence secured from the phone. However, they did not disclose what that was. In addition, police have never released details on the girl's murder. In the five years since the murder, the case has taken many turns. A sketch of a person of interest was released early on. However, no leads came, and two years later, the police would announce a new direction and provide an updated sketch, citing the last sketch was secondary. Police have stated they have reason to believe the suspect is hiding in plain sight and is certainly familiar with Delphi, either living there or working there. Police have also said they have a witness. However, they did not disclose what this witness seen. There have been at least six persons of interest that the public knew about, and no doubt many more that we don't know about. Most of these have been eliminated, except for the most recent one. Keegan Klein of Peru, Indiana, who is currently in jail awaiting trial for 30 other charges. Keegan was allegedly running a fake social media account with a male model to solicit nude photos of underage girls, and police now know that the profile was talking to Liberty German through Instagram, and in the chat they were discussing meeting the day when the murder occurred. The problem though is Keegan has stated multiple scumbags have used that Instagram account, as they were working together targeting multiple victims. Although that could be a cop-out to avoid responsibility, but police have confirmed they know at least two individuals were using that profile. The case is very active right now, and many expect something big to happen soon. Devil Monkeys Devil monkeys are a cryptid supposedly living in the wooded areas of Flagstaff, Arizona. The animal is a baboon-like primate that is about four to five feet tall, very quick, and agile. They are described as having powerful, almost kangaroo-like legs, a trait shared with the chupacabra, 
Other distinguishing traits include a three-toed razor-clawed feet, tiny pointed ears, and a long, often bushy tail. They have also been spotted in nearby states such as New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. The first alleged encounter took place in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee in 1934. Witnesses recorded the beast leaping across the field with lightning speed. They noted that he could leap up to 20 feet. The second and most famous sighting happened in Saltville, Virginia in 1959. A family would claim they were traveling and that an eight black beast jumped on and attacked their car, leaving three scratch marks on the vehicle. It was described as having a light taffy color with a white blaze down its neck and underbelly. It stood on two large well-muscled back legs and had short front legs or arms. Several days after this, two nurses driving home from work would also be attacked. This time the creature would rip the top off the convertible. In the 70s, more sightings would occur. One in Albany, Kentucky would end up with slaughtered livestock. By the late 90s, sightings would pop up in Ohio and New Hampshire. At this point, they would all seem to be tied to the Appalachian Mountains. It wasn't until 2009 when devil monkeys would start appearing in the Deep South. A biologist in rural Louisiana would report, The creature ran on all fours to a spot on the fence where the trees were about 30 feet apart and leapt over the five-foot fence in one hop. Once on my side of the fence, this thing stood up on two legs. It was only about 30 feet from me at that point, and I got a really good look at it. It was about four feet tall, maybe a little bit bigger. It had really big yellowish eyes, large pointy ears, and a sparse coat of shaggy fur. It stood on its tiptoes and had a long, somewhat bushy tail, kind of like a squirrel, but not nearly as thick. The snout was cat-like. I was close enough to make out thick hairs on the face. I'm inclined to believe that it might have been whiskers. Once it stood, it kept its arms to its side, much like a human, but slightly bent at the elbows. Its hands had identifiable fingers with noticeable claws." End quote. Starting in the 2010s, the sightings started to shift to Arizona and the broader southwest. All the sightings in the Appalachians have disappeared. Could the creature have migrated, or does it even exist? Dr. No. In 1981, a body of a young woman would be found in Miami County, Ohio. After examination, it was determined the victim died from strangulation after receiving a head injury beforehand. The victim would be identified in 2018 as Marsha King. However, in that timeline between 1981 and 2018, an additional eight and possibly more victims would be found. The killer always had the same MO, which was to beat and strangle the victim and usually leaving the victim to be found with her underwear and shoes missing. Sometimes all the clothes would be missing. Eventually, in 1986, a lead would develop. The body of a 23-year-old prostitute, Shirley Dean Taylor, would be discovered. Before she was discovered, however, she had been seen at a Union 76 truck stop. According to witnesses that she had spoke to, she had mentioned she was going to see a regular named Dr. No. This would be the last time she was seen alive. A year later in 1987, another lead would come about. A 27-year-old Anne Marie Patterson would be arrested for prostitution. She would bring up a sketchy client named Dr. No. She would later go on to describe that he was extremely negative and hard to deal with. She would also describe what he was driving in his appearance. A week later, Patterson would disappear. Witnesses would report the night that she vanished Dr. No had been on the CB looking for a girl to pick up. Her body would be found 40 days later and 250 miles away in Austin Town, near Cincinnati. At this point, police obviously knew he was a truck driver, but they still had no idea who the man was. Two more victims would perish in 1987, but at least one more witness would see and report the truck. Between 1988 and 1990, at least two more victims would be discovered. During the course of the investigation, police would interview hundreds of prostitutes, pimps, service station employees, and truck drivers. The man was described as a tall, large man with fair skin and dark hair, between 25 and 40, wore glasses and had a northeastern accent. Finally, in 2019, a 49-year-old Samuel Legg would be arrested in Arizona. Authorities using DNA profiling were able to prove his guilt in at least four murders in Ohio and Illinois. They would link his first murder back to 1989, when Legg was only 20, meaning that the murders in 1981 could not have been Legg since he was 11 years old and not driving. He was also suspected of killing his stepdaughter in the early 90s, but police could never link him to the case. So if we concede that Legg was truck driving at 18, which was very unlikely, that would put him responsible for the three 1987 murders. However, four of the murders preceding that year and one attempted murder 
could not be attributed to Leg. So who was it? Death of Edgar Allan Poe. On a rainy October 3, 1849, Joseph Walker, a compositor for the Baltimore Sun, was headed out to Gunner's Hall. It was election day, and the hall served as a polling place. When he arrived, he found a delirious man dressed in second-hand clothes lying in the gutter. The man was semi-conscious, and when Walker approached, he made a startling discovery. The man was none other than the famous poet Edgar Allan Poe. Walker would ask Poe how he could help. Poe would give Walker the name of Joseph E. Snodgrass, a magazine editor with some medical training. Walker would immediately try to contact Snodgrass. Poe had left Richmond, Virginia a week earlier headed to Philadelphia. When Walker reached Poe, it was the first time anyone had heard from him since his departure from Richmond. Poe never made it. In the four days between Walker finding Poe and Poe's death, he never regained consciousness to explain what had happened why he was in dirty clothes that didn't belong to him incoherent in the streets. Instead, Poe spent his final days wavering between delirium and visual hallucinations. Poe would repeatedly call out for a Reynolds, a figure who remains a mystery to this day. There are several theories as to what happened to the literary giant. One of the early theories was Poe was beaten. Possibly after a woman accused Poe of harming her, a group of men would try to defend her honor. Other possibilities was Poe was drunk and robbed by ruffians. The practice known as cooping was also considered, where gangs were known to kidnap victims, disguise them up, and force them to vote for a specific candidate multiple times under multiple identities. Other theories that were considered was a possible suicide attempt or a brain tumor, along with various diseases that could have affected his brain, things such as lead poisoning and mercury poisoning. The truth is, there's so many theories with so little proof and no medical records or documents, including the death certificate, even exist, if they ever did. Elisa Lamb Another one everyone has heard of, the Elisa Lamb story. On January 31st, 2013, 21-year-old Elisa Lamb was scheduled to check out of the Cecil Hotel and leave for Santa Cruz. Elisa would contact her parents daily on this trip. That was until she decided to check out. As the day went along, her parents would begin to worry and contact authorities immediately. Hotel staff would note that Elisa was alone that day. Police would search the hotel as much as they could. They even took dogs to Lamb's room and other parts of the building, including the rooftop, but the dogs never picked up a scent. By February 6th, a week after Lamb had been seen, the LAPD decided to put flyers up with her image in the neighborhood and online. Nothing happened. Then another week later on the 13th, the LAPD would release the last known sighting of her and it was eerie to say the least. It was footage from an elevator security camera. In the two and a half minute footage, Lamb was alone, and she kept making unusual moves and gestures, even leaving the elevator at one point while its doors remained open, even after she appears to have pressed every button. The video would go viral. A few days later on February 19th, a hotel maintenance worker would respond to a guest complaint about low water pressure. He would make his way to one of the four 1,000 gallon tanks located on the roof. Through the open hatch, he saw Lamb lying face down in the water. The coroner would state that she died from accidental drowning with bipolar disorder as a significant factor. Elisa had been found naked. However, clothes matching what she was last wearing in the elevator were also in the water. An autopsy would reveal no trauma, sexual assault, or suicide attempt. Toxicology tests showed traces consistent with prescription medication found in her belongings and a very small quantity of alcohol. However, it was noted that the concentration of her prescription drugs in her system indicated she had been under-medicating or stopped taking her prescription recently. Even with the cause of death established, no one was able to figure out how she got to the tank in the first place. Access to the roof was locked with only staff having the passcode and keys. Also, the door had an alarm. Apart from how she got on the roof, others wondered how she got into the tank by herself. The four tanks were four foot by eight foot popped up on concrete blocks with no fixed access to them. Hotel workers had to use a ladder to get to them. The most popular theory is that she was just having a psychotic episode, most likely due to the fact that she had been under medicating leading up to the events. Other theories proposed have been a hotel cover-up or paranormal activity, stemming from the fact that the Cecil Hotel was supposed to be haunted. And that's all for part one of layer one of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg. If you like this content, please like and subscribe so the YouTube algorithm can do its thing.